Okay, so welcome everybody. So this is um, the first uh, of a series of seminars that we hope to do at least bi-weekly if there is enormous uh, request and uh, support, we may consider doing them more often. Uh, and they are broadly speaking uh, uh, on subjects of interest to the booster community, but of course that's uh, very broadly construed, and uh, we're very glad to have John uh, kick off this series of seminars, and he's gonna tell us today about the, uh, a 3D IZ model weekly couple string dual. Now, um, I um, have unmuted you all, with the except of John, uh, and uh, if you have a question, you can use the chat ah. and type it there. Now, uh, I don't know whether we could just unmute everybody, but I'm a little bit afraid of that. That will create a little bit of uh, too much uh, interaction, uh, but uh, let's see how this goes. So, um, if somebody uh, has a question, perhaps they can either ask it in the chat or raise their hands. There's also an option on Zoom to raise your hand. Uh, and if you raise your hand, uh, you can then be unmuted. I, I, uh, I, I suppose I have to unmute you. You can unmute yourself. I'm not exactly sure, but... Uh, that's false. That's fa what is false? We can unmute ourselves. Okay, great. Then, uh, then I think uh, that's wonderful. So you can um, you can uh, unmute yourself if you need to ask a question, and uh, and that's great. Let's get started. Thank you. Thank you, Leonardo. Thanks for the invitation. This is exciting, exciting opportunity. Um, um, so yeah, I've I've given one Zoom seminar before, and a, actually a, a bunch of Zoom lectures for my class, and. Um, one thing I've noticed is that people people are more hesitant to speak up than than in person. Even even relatively lively uh, groups of people can be kind of subdued in this format. So I, I I'd like to encourage you to try to you know do unmute, unmute yourself if you have something to say and, and stop me and ask questions. It'll be more fun for everyone. Um, otherwise, we could just show a recording, right? We don't have to all be here at the same time. So anyway, um, so. Uh, good morning. It's morning for me. I think it's probably it's evening for, for many of you. It's an interesting experience. Um, and this talk is a uh, it's based on work with Nabil Iqbal from Durham, uh, and it's a uh, hopefully a fun uh, melange of uh, uh, subjects. It, there's the motivation that, that I'll describe is from quantum condensed matter physics. Um, the thing that that we were motivated to do, I guess, has overlap with with some. Uh, uh, old work in string theory. Um, and uh, the thing we actually ended up doing is really a problem in statistical physics um, and maybe also a bit of arts and crafts, as you'll see. Um, so um, how do I go forward? Okay, so uh, I, here's, here's an outline. First, I'm, I'm gonna spend a little while giving, uh, trying to explain the, the reasons that, that led Nabil and me to revisit this old and difficult question. Um, Perhaps well, okay. I'll I'll explain our motivations, and then we'll we'll do something which which in retrospect maybe is a bit, a bit misguided, uh, for reasons that 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 some of you will know right away, and and uh, and the rest of you will see when we figure it out. Um, but I think I think I'm I'm happy that we did it. I sort of you know I, we did it in the spirit of well maybe this is misguided, but it'll be interesting anyway. We'll see what happens. And one interesting thing that came out about it came out of it is a, a mystery about the ordinary 3D Ising model which uh, um, I, I, I still don't understand, and which, which I'll talk about the end. at the end, maybe somebody can, can figure it out. Um, that would be fun. So, so here's the motivation. Um, th this, this, is, this work is really part of a program that uh, various people have been undertaking in the last few years to, to sort of rehabilitate the reputation of Landau. And uh, yeah, you may not think that his reputation needs to be rehabilitated, but if you've been to a quantum, a hard condensed matter talk in the last, I don't know, 15 years or so, um, you've seen that, that he really takes a beating in the introductions 
to, to nearly nearly every such talk, which you know often begin with the format, uh, you know, with the statement of the form. Well, Landau told us that phases of matter are classified by symmetries, um, but here I'm going to tell you about some phase of matter that's that's uh, distinguished instead by topology, um, and uh, and so so. Uh, some recent progress ha has uh, sort of allowed allowed us to incorporate many of many of these these sort of apparent exceptions to, to Landau's paradigm uh, into a, a a broader improved version of his paradigm. Um, so so let me let me say let me say how that works. Um, so so yeah, a sort of safe way to say uh, the perspective this perspective is that the phases of matter are classified by how they represent their symmetry. So for example, if um, if they uh, if they spontaneously break a symmetry, that's a way to distinguish them from a phase which does not. And uh, a sort of second aspect of that is that if we have in a phase of matter some degeneracy in the ground state, or a sort of extreme version of that is is gapless excitations above the ground state, is that we should think of those as Goldstone modes for spontaneously broken symmetries, either. Um, continuous in, in the case of gapless excitations or discrete in the case of, of degeneracy. And uh, there are some apparent exceptions to this uh, perspective on the world, um, which some of which have been known for a long time, uh, maybe the most prominent of which is, is topological order, which is uh, um, the, the possibility that, that there's a degeneracy uh, there are degenerate ground states which are which are not distinguished by any local or order parameter. Um, don't don't yeah don't break any any zero form symmetry as we'll see, and uh, um, and so for example the deconfined phase of discrete lattice gauge theory or uh, various rational quantum Hall states realize this phenomenon. Um, another another perhaps more well easier to see example of a apparent exception to this is, is phases of matter where, where a gauge theory is, is uh, with a continuous gauge group is deconfined, so such as the Coulomb phase of the UNA. And then I have a, a list of some other examples which are apparent exceptions to, to this scheme of, of th thinking about the world, which uh, are in red because I, I actually don't know how to yet uh, incorporate them into the Landau paradigm. Um, or at least I don't know how to do it in, in a simple way that I want to talk about today. So I won't, I won't say more about those. Okay, so then, but the, the progress, okay, so but, the progress that I was referring to is, is the idea of generalizing the notion of, of symmetries. And uh, the, basic, the basic point is to realize that even an ordinary symmetry, which what we should call a zero-form symmetry, is a, is a topological fact about the theory. So that is, um, if we have a conserved current, then it implies the existence of a charge, which is integrated over a co-dimension one slice of space time, so say a, a, a constant time slice. And the statement that that's, that's time independent is, is more broadly interpreted as the statement that it's a topological object. That is, it only depends on the topology of the slice that you integrated over, um, where we think of um, uh, the insertions of charged operators as, as like holes in the space time that you can't go around. Uh, if you go around a charge operator, that changes the topology of the surface. Um, and the simple generalization of this idea is we can have a, uh, an, a conserved current which has an extra index, uh, like, like this, which um, so it's conserved in the sense that it's divergence free. And uh, again, we can define, uh, we can associate this with a sort of charge, but because it has an extra index, we have to integrate it over a, a co-dimension two uh, slice of space time. And the, sta the statement of current conservation then implies analogously that this, this uh, charge associated with the co-dimension two uh, region of space, space time is, uh, is topological, that it, it only depends on the topological class of this surface that we integrated over. Um, so in the, in the case of an ordinary symmetry, the charged object, objects are local operators um, supported at a point. Um, and in the case of a one-form symmetry, the charged objects are instead loops. And the, the analog of the, sta the statement that they're charged is, is basically that um, acting by commutators, this, this charge, uh, th it's, an, it's an eigenvector of the charge operator. Um, and so a good example to, to keep in mind is, is in free Maxwell theory. So the, the Bianchi identity implies that uh, star F is a, is a conserved current. And the associated charged operator 
is charge object is the a tiff loop. A twiddle is the dual gauge field. And in the absence of, of electrically charged matter, uh, the field shrink itself is also a conserved uh, conserved current by Maxwell by Maxwell's equation. And uh, in that case, the Wilson loop is the charged object. Um, we can define uh, unitaries that represent these symmetries on the Hilbert space uh, by exponentiating the charge in the usual way in the, in the zero form case, and by exponentiating the charge in, basically in the usual way in the case of, of higher form symmetries. And the, so the, the basic consequence of the presence of a zero form symmetry uh, is that there, the world lines of charged particles, if it's particles that carry the charge, um, can't end. The only way they can end is, is by being created or annihilated by, by charged operators. Um, and the analogous statement in the case of one-form symmetries is that there are charged string world sheets that can't, can't end or break, except uh, on these, these charged operator supported loops. And in both cases, there's a, there's a finite group version uh, where we simply restrict this parameter alpha to be, uh, well, restrict it to be um, two pi over two pi over k. Um, and the consequence of, of, of breaking that continuous symmetry to a discrete one is that now the particles can disappear in groups of k, or the strings can end in groups of k. Okay, so why, why am I talking about this? Well, it gives us a, a generalization of, of, of how to label phases of matter. So you, we, usually, we usually classify phases of matter by what they do to their zero form symmetry. So for example, we can have un, an unbroken phase of a zero form symmetry, which means that the correlations of, of uh, uh, charged operators are short ranged. And now I want you to think of a charged operator for purposes of generalization as both the operator of charge Q and its conjugate operator of charge minus Q, its, its dagger. Uh, and think of these as the as the two points of a zero sphere. And so when I say that the, the object grows, what I mean is that the two points are being separated. Uh, the region in between the charged operators is growing. And so, so that this is usually what we mean by saying that the, the symmetry is unbroken, the correlations of charged operators fall off exponentially. And but so for purposes of generalization, think about this distance between the two points as the area of the zero sphere. Um, we can similarly define an unbroken phase of a one-form symmetry by, by the same condition that correlators of charged operators are short-ranged. Um, and now, now that's just the expectation value of this loop operator uh, in the limit when the loop is large. And that's, it's the statement that it satisfies an area law. That is, it, go, it goes like e to the minus the area inside the loop. And in the case of, of e and m, the area law for the a tough loop is, is a, that's a good way to see that it's in a superconducting phase, that the photon is massive. And so, so there are, we can also so we can have unbroken phases, and we can have phases where the symmetry is, is broken. Uh, a broken phase for a zero form symmetry means that the the correlations are, of charged operators are long ranged; they don't fall off with with distance. And uh, the analogous statement for for a one form symmetry is that it satisfies a perimeter law. So this is basically this is the same as this condition because you see you can uh, you can add counter terms along the loop to cancel off this perimeter part. And so it basically just means that it's a constant. Um, and uh, the gaplessness of the photon in the Coulomb phase of, of free electromagnetism can be understood as, uh, as a consequence uh, of, of such a spontaneously broken U11 form symmetry. One way to see this is, is um, uh, by coupling to a background field. So in the case of uh, spontaneously breaking an ordinary U1 zero form symmetry, we, we couple to a background uh, one form gauge field. And uh, gauge invariance, so the, the, the fact that it's, it's broken means that there has to be an A squared term, there's a Meissner effect. And then gauge invariance requires that, that the Goldstone mode appears in this combination with that background one form field, which looks like a kinetic term for the Goldstone mode, and it can't have any other, any other couplings, selective like potential. And so, the, so this is the, the Goldstone field. And uh, analogous reasoning says that, there, that in the case of a one form symmetry, the spontaneous breaking of the symmetry generates a B squared term, and then gauge invariance requires there to be uh, this this Maxwell term for, for this for this field, this one form field, um, and so so the Maxwell the presence of the Maxwell term and the absence of other couplings for this A total are a consequence of this uh, breaking of the spontaneous breaking of the one form symmetry. So so that's nice in the sense that we can incorporate uh, more. Uh, one more phase into the Landau paradigm. And um, the case of, of topological order 
is actually even easier. So, you know, one way to define topological order is, is simply to say that we have degenerate ground states, ground states which become become degenerate in the thermodynamic limit, which uh, aren't connected to each other that by, by any local operators. That is, to get from one such ground state to another one, you have to act with an operator whose support is extended over the whole system, wraps around some cycles of the space-time. And uh, such an operator is exactly uh, the, the unitary that, that realizes a discrete one-form symmetry. Um, so it's sort of it's sort of by definition that that spontaneous symmetry, spontaneous breaking of a discrete higher form symmetry uh, is topological order as, as long as such loop such extended operators don't uh, act trivially on the vacuum they have to take such as take a, the ground state to another one um, so therefore there's topological order so for example just just to be a little more concrete um, we we can think about topological order of zk gauge theory in d space time dimensions by saying that there's these two higher form symmetries, a one form symmetry and a D minus two form symmetry, which are represented on the Hilbert space by these, by an, an operator supported on a curve and an operator supported on a D minus two surface and, uh, and which satisfy this, uh, this algebra. Um, and uh, so this is the algebra of electric and magnetic flux surfaces in ZK gauge theory, which a simple way to realize it is, is, is BF theory where this, this equation follows just from the canonical commutators of B and A. Um, another example is, is say, the Laughlin uh, fractional quantum Hall order, where there's a single one-form symmetry, which has, has this, this same kind of commutation relation with itself, um, which uh, you know, is, implements the statement that the, the magnetic flux carries the charge, um, and, and it implies that there are K ground states of, of this of this system on, on the two torus. And you know, so whether the most general actually we don't know how to describe the most general topologically ordered state uh, in this language, but but I think it's really just a matter of, of uh, uh, figuring out how to say it. It's sort of a by definition um, that this you know this is a description of topological order. Okay, so there's a second aspect of of Landau's paradigm, a sort of more ambitious aspect, which is that not only can you understand the phases of matter, but you can also understand continuous transitions between them uh, by thinking about how the symmetries are represented. In particular, that at, at the critical point, we should be able to understand, at such a critical point, we should be able to understand that what are the critical degrees of freedom in terms of the fluctuations of the, the order parameter, whatever it is. And again, there are some uh, important apparent, apparent exceptions to, to this point of view. Um, the first of which is that there are examples of direct transitions between states which break different symmetries, different zero form symmetries, uh, such as say here, here's some control parameter, over here we have an antiferromagnet, over here we have some, a state that breaks some lattice symmetries, and, um, but nevertheless, there can be direct transitions, a direct continuous transition from one to the other. So this, this apparently goes beyond Landau's story. Um, since the critical degrees of freedom on one side should be apparently different from the ones on the other side. And, uh, and also transitions out of topological order states seem like they should be beyond this paradigm since, uh, since there isn't a local order parameter. And uh, actually both of these examples can, can be understood as consequences of symmetries. And in the case of the, this nail to PBS transition or more generally deconfined quantum critical points, um, it's possible to understand uh, the nature of the critical point as a consequence of, of some, some mixed or tough anomalies between the symmetries. Um, I don't want to focus on that example. That's not, that's not the subject of today, but I, um, okay. but I think it also can be incorporated into this uh, worldview. Um, the, what I do want to talk about, though, is, is uh, transitions out of topologically ordered states. So suppose we have some, so here, here's uh, this, this part of the phase diagram of Z2 gauge theory represents a state where a one-form symmetry is spontaneously broken. And uh, um, can we understand the transition out of it through, across these walls here um, in terms of fluctuations of this string order parameter? And uh, uh, on the other hand, by, uh, by the duality between the 3, 3D Ising gauge theory and uh, the, the ordinary Ising model, this phase transition is, is basically in the same universality class as the, as the 3D Ising model. Um, the duality doesn't, doesn't preserve all of the global properties, but the, the local, local operators are the same. 
And so this uh, um, taking seriously this, this, this idea that we should still be able to understand this critical point in terms of the fluctuation of the order parameter, in this case, the order parameter creates strings. This uh, leads us leads us to the to the, the idea that we should that, that the three D Ising model near its critical point should should have a description as a string theory. So this was this was how we were sort of led by the nose to to revisit this question. Um, and of, of course, this is not, not the first uh, first time such a idea has been suggested. Let me uh, let me let me make some comments about about uh, the history of this idea. Well, okay. Let me let me make some comments about earlier versions of, of this uh, this idea um, from from other points of view with other motivations. So, you know, our, our, the reason that we might hope to to make some progress is well, first of all, we're going to be a little bit um, we're going to mess with the Eisen model. We're not going to uh, worry about uh, having a string dual of exactly the three D Eisen model on the cubic lattice. Um, so hopefully, you know. That's a tool that we can use. Um, the second, the second point is is that uh, we've learned quite a bit about about non-perturbative string theory since 1994. Um, maybe maybe we can learn something new. Um, and I guess I guess maybe I should say um, uh, we do know, in some sense, a holographic example, holographic dual of the 3D Isaac model um, from from Klebanov and Polyakov as a sort of uh, higher spin theory. Uh, at strong coupling, um, but I guess I guess here the hope is to to really find a description in terms of strings, since that was the the motivation that we were we were led to, and we'll see how far we get. No, no, I'm not. Okay, don't don't get too optimistic about it. Um, so so to so let me let me back up and explain what why you know a sort of the old fashioned point of view of why there should be a string theory description of the three D IC model, and to do that let's start at two dimensions. So here's the partition function of the 2D Ising model on the triangle as, um, and uh, as a sum over spins on the triangles. And if I draw the, the um, dual lattice of the triangle lattice, that is if I draw a wall separating every, every uh, site of the triangle lattice, which I didn't draw, um, then a configuration of the spins on the triangle lattice, which I've drawn, I've drawn say the up spins in red and nothing for the down spins, um, can be described by saying where are the the domain walls that separate continue contiguous regions of, of up spins, and we can uh, so that specifies the spin configuration up to the global symmetry action up to flipping all of the spins, and so the partition function uh, in terms of spins on, on the triangular lattice is equal to a sum over these curves these these blue curves, um, weighted by their length right so the, the length of this uh, curve is, is counts how many disagreements there are, and uh, up to a factor of two, which comes from this global symmetry. Um, now that's on the honeycomb lattice. On the square lattice, there's there's something that can something annoying that can happen in for purposes of this domain wall description. Namely, we can have a, a configuration where where um, two of these domain walls meet at a vertex. So like here, uh, these these domain walls are meeting, and uh, as we just saw, that we can avoid this issue by thinking about a lattice where the um, the sites are trivalent, have only three edges coming off of them. But um, the resolution of this technicality is instructive. So let me let me mention it. So um, there there are three ways we could interpret this configuration as a configuration of domain walls. That is, we could think about it like this, where it's one domain here and one domain here. We could think about it like this, one domain here and one domain here. Or we could think about it as two walls which are crossing each other. And, um, and so a way to resolve this, a way to, to do the right counting while summing over all possible configurations of these loops, of these paths, is to weight them by minus one to the number of self-intersections. Um, because you see, this, this choice of resolution of this collision co would come with a minus one because it intersects itself, whereas these two don't. And so the sum of these three, of the contributions of these three configurations would be equal to the, to the, the actual um, partition sum of the spins. Um, and this is a useful observation because this, this phase has a nice interpretation. If we uh, exponentiate that sum over loops into a sum over connected loops, then we recognize this, um, this factor here as uh, the phase that's needed to describe the world line sum of a, of a fermion, of a fermion in two dimensions. And uh, um, 
another consequence of that is that with periodic boundary conditions, only even even winding configurations actually bound some region of uh, some re region of up spins. The the walls have to be uh, simply connected, and uh, and so in the partition function on the two torus, um, we have to insert these projectors onto even winding configurations, uh, which which you can recognize as the sum over spin structures on the two torus. Um, that is the, the fermion number is, is gauged. The two D Ising model doesn't actually have any any, any fermionic excitations. Okay, so that's the that's the nice story in two dimensions of how the domain walls actually describe fermion world lines. And oh, oh, so, sorry, but we can we can be more precise in this case. That is, uh, we can actually make the fermion operator um, as a combination of the spin and the disorder operator. So the disorder operator is a thing which um, changes the sign of the interaction along some curve C up to some branch point X, which is, says where the operator is. And um, uh, this, is in, this operator is only labeled by X and not by C because we can move the curve C uh, without changing, it, changing anything by using, taking advantage of the symmetry. And the usual Ising model self-duality on the square lattice interchanges this disorder operator and the spin operator. Um, but if we make the self-dual object that is a product of the spin operator and the disorder operator nearby, then that thing can be can be seen to be a fermion because under a two pi rotation, this uh, branch cut, the, the spin operator has to go through this branch cut and gets a minus sign, and it satisfies a lattice version of the Dirac equation. Um, it becomes the massless Dirac equation at the critical point. So this this is the the beautiful story in two dimensions, and so what happens in three dimensions? So in three dimensions, the walls are, are uh, surfaces, are two-dimensional surfaces, the walls separating regions of upspins. Um, and uh, the analog of the disorder operator, is, it's defined in terms of a curve, and we flip the signs of the interactions on some, some surface which, which, whose boundary is that curve. Again, it's independent of which surface it is because of the symmetry. Um, and again, we can try to define a some, something like the Fermi operator by combining this disorder operator with a product of spins along in, in the neighborhood of this curve. And Polykov showed that, that um, this object satisfies something like the, the free Dirac equation for each link participating in the curve, but then these, these uh, free Dirac particles are, are nevertheless strongly coupled to each other by the fact that they're connected by the, they have to lie on the domain wall, which, is, which can't be broken. Um, and so this is this is a description which sounds a bit like the Ramon never short superstring. That is, uh, each that the you know the string satisfies some some two D some version of the Dirac equation at each point. And so it suggests that the domain walls should have something to do with a Ramon never short string. Um, and uh, so to okay. So this. Uh, analog of, of the ambiguity on the square lattice also happens on the cubic lattice. And um, um, in particular, the, the same, a, a given configuration of spins can be interpreted in multiple ways as the configuration of domain walls. And in 1992, Dissler showed that um, there was a nice analog of this self-intersection number, which is, which is the Euler character, um, the Euler character of, of the embedded surface. And uh, um, Okay, so just as in the two-dimensional case, we can avoid this issue by working on a, on a lattice where the edges uh, only have three faces coming off of them. But um, this, this um, observation was important to me because it emphasized that the absolute, at least the absolute value of the string coupling, uh, that is the, the coupling which, which weights diff configurations, different world sheets of different, uh, of different uh, genus, um, and s suppresses the, the contributions of many string loops is, uh, is equal to one in this case. So this is a strongly coupled uh, string theory, whatever else it is. Uh, John, can I ask you a question? Yeah, please. Uh, so is, is this statement uh, is, is, uh, is supposed to be exact? Um, I'm a little confused by what is exactly summed over because uh, mm -hmm. I, I mean, is one supposed to be summed over emerged uh, surfaces? Yeah, yeah, that's that's right. That's what that's what Disler is doing. But yeah. but is, is that actually a well-defined thing in on the on this lattice? <clears throat> May I have a comment? Excuse me. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, Maybe okay. you can help me. I work on that long time. Uh, it's not correct statement about Euler's activity. It's a question of indeed immersion. 
uh, on the lattice, you can imagine that the singular points are this, have a distance which allows you to have a uh, Euler characteristics not corresponding to their amount. Uh, it's absolutely not a correct statement that is coming with the Euler characteristics. Tested many, uh, there are many examples of surfaces that are breaking that. I, okay, I, I'd be interested to learn more and more more about that. But actually, um, the thing I'm going to do doesn't depend on Dissler's construction. Um, well, it uh, doesn't work at all. <laughs> have nothing, the Euler characteristics have nothing to do with this uh, uh, sign factor of Isaac Mundell. Um, okay. Okay. Um, uh, so yeah, actually, the construction that I'm I'm actually going to talk about doesn't doesn't rely on this. Um, and and okay, maybe. And actually, there is an easier way for me to make the point that I want to make on this slide, which is simply that um, here we're summing over surfaces. Um, so the, in the Ising model, the the weight of a configuration is the area of is e to the minus two beta times the area of the of the domain walls. Okay. And in particular factor, it has totally different description and uh, Euler characteristic is uh, is not a topological uh, number which describes it. It's, you should consider uh, obstacles preventing uh, embeddings. Uh, it's, uh, this factor is connected with the second cohomological class with coefficients and the P1 SO2, something like that. Okay, sorry. Oh, okay. So actually, maybe maybe you'll like what I'll say. I'll say later. Um, yeah, okay. But but the point the point I really wanted to make in this slide is simply that in the vanilla Ising model, uh, some some over configurations in terms of domain walls, whatever whatever you do to resolve this issue. For example, okay, let's just think about let's just think about say the BCC lattice or or uh, um, or this corner corner sharing octahedron lattice where the edges share only three uh, faces. Um, the the weight. The, there, there's no dependence of the weight on the or on the genus of the surface. That, that's really the point I want to make. And so, uh, whatever you want to say about the sign, the 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 effective string coupling of these surfaces interpreted as as string world sheets is one. Okay. So so um, so that sounds bad, right? We don't we don't know how to you know how to say that means we, we can't do perturbation theory. And so so. Uh, Nabil and I asked, asked ourselves a very naive question about this, which is, can we mess with it? Can we modify the Isimol so that, so that the, the dual string theory is weakly coupled? That is, dec decrease the weight of domain walls with higher genus in their contributions to the sum. So to modify the partition function to be, to be something, like, something like this. Um, we'll talk about how to, resol how to resolve this sum on the lattice uh, in, in great detail in just a minute. But what, what I mean is make it so that spheres are more important than, than donuts. Um, and uh, I guess the perspective we had in mind is that there's sort of two, two possible outcomes, uh, assuming that there's still a continuous transition uh, with this modification, which there is. Um, making, making, some, making the string coupling finite here, you know, it might lead to some, some new universality class where, where, uh, where spheres are more important, are, 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 are dominant. Um, or the probably more conservative possibility is that it, it just changes the critical temperature, but leaves the same universality class. So, so uh, we decided to explore this a little bit, and uh, um, and so the model the model that we define. Well, okay. So, so the question we asked ourselves is how do we change the string coupling? And being you know complicated-minded string theorists, the thing that we we thought of first was attaching matrices to the world sheet, and don't don't pay too much attention to this. Um, uh, this turned out to be not such a great idea. Instead, we can do something very simple. Um, oh, hello. Um, we can do something very simple, which is, uh, which is just explicitly change the weight in the sum. That is, when we uh, look at a configuration of spins on the lattice, the, the weight with which it contributes is the usual Boltzmann factor for the Ising model, and then times the factor of g-string to, uh, to some power of the early character defined as the number of faces minus the number of edges plus the number of vertices that participate in the domain wall. The configuration of domain walls defined by that spin configuration. And uh, an important point is that this is a local Hamiltonian, right? This, this number of faces is a, it's a, you just do a sum over the whole lattice. 
uh, a single time. It's, a, it's just a lo local modification of the Ising Hamilton. Uh, it requires a little bit of refinement, at least on the cubic lattice, which is analogous to this ambiguity that we saw earlier. So if I, if I look at a single vertex here on the dual lattice, I have to ask how many, in how many domain walls does that participate? And in this configuration, uh, you know, clearly it's two, right? We have to count this vertex once for this domain wall and once for this part of the domain wall. But for this one, this configuration here, it's less obvious. In particular, we could resolve it either into this plus this or this plus this plus this, in which case it would contribute either two times or three times to the total Euler characteristic. And one possible resolution of this, one way to resolve this issue, analogous to going to the honeycomb lattice, is to energetically penalize the configurations which are ambiguous. And we can do this, so just as a test, we could do the same thing in the, in the two-dimensional Ising model, where we, where we change the energy of a configuration where, these, um, where there's an ambiguity. And uh, in that case, it doesn't change the critical behavior, it just moves, the, moves TC. Preserves, it preserves, for example, the order parameter, no, the correlation length exponent. But it's not so great because you have to throw away configurations where, where they want to touch. It's bad for the Monte Carlo acceptance rate. And it, you know, it's, it's changing the model more than we'd like. Um, a second, so a second way to resolve this ambiguity is to decide on a decomposition of each configuration into what you can think of as elementary constituents. So it's actually possible to do this in a, in a way that preserves all the, last, all the symmetries of the problem by thinking about, so look at a single vertex. Um, for each vertex, there are two to the eight possible configurations of, of the spins on the neighboring sites of the original lattice. And uh, think of that as a, a binary vector um, with a zero or one for each, each possible wall that may or may not be there. And order those possible configurations by the number of faces and then choose, choose a basis with, with lowest weight. So that would decompose this configuration into, into the sum of these two, and it would decompose this configuration into the sum of these three configurations. And that can be, that, that's a symmetric prescription for resolving this issue. That's not quite the end of the story though, because not all ways of resolving, uh, interpreting a given vertex are compatible with each other. And I think this is related to the, the issue that Ara was mentioning. Um, in particular, uh, if we choose, so at this vertex, we say that um, uh, two and four are connected to each other and one and three are connected to each other. But at this vertex, we say that two and three are connected to each other and one and four are connected to each other. Then there's some kind of branch point in the middle. And so uh, without doing this, for example, our, 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 uh, our code interpreted this, this object here, which, which maybe you can see is clearly just a, a sphere attached to another sphere. Um, and it, interp it interpreted it as an object with Euler character five. And uh, it took us a little while to figure this out, but, but what's going on is that if there's a disagreement uh, in the interpretation between two neighboring walls, um, it means that there's a, there's a four pi branch point al along that wall, which uh, a four pi branch point con contributes minus one to the Euler character. Um, so one way to think about this is if I have two, two sheets um, of a, say a square root branch cut, if you go around the branch point here, you have to go around four pi before coming back to yourself. And that, that, re that represents like a wormhole between those two things. Um, so each end of the branch point counts as half of a wormhole. And if, if you want to understand this a little better, um, in our appendix, we have an appendix with a, a, a template where you can make your own four pi branch point, which ends up looking something like this, where uh, um, you can see that around this point, you have to, you have to go four pi in order, to, in order to get back to where you started um, and uh, convince yourself that, that that contributes minus one to the other character. Um, okay. yeah. Yes, please. I have a question. Please. Uh, is there a simple description of this modified Hamiltonian in terms of uh, spin, the original um, degrees of freedom? Yeah, that depends on your definition of simple. Um, so, so there is a description of it in terms of the spins. The, the way that we've written it is, uh, it's, it's a little bit ugly. I think it involves 12 spins at a time. Um, and it's written in terms of projectors onto particular configurations of the spins. So, so lots of factors of one minus S, uh, SI, products of one minus SI, that kind of thing. Um, uh, so it's, I mean, it's elementary in the sense that you can, you can tell it to a computer. Uh, and it, it, it's local in the sense that it, it only depends on on some neighborhood of the spins, it's not 
you know, it's it's something like 12, 12 spins around a, a side of the a side of the lattice. I think that's right. Um, but um, yeah, so you wouldn't want to. I don't think you'd want to spend too much time staring at it. Um, yeah, so it's well defined, but but not, Thank you. not simple. Yeah. Okay. Um, so given this, so we we've defined two two models, two two modifications of the Ising model on the cubic lattice, um, which I'll refer to as the branch point regularization, where we do this business with keeping track of the branch points, and the no-touching regularization, where the, the walls sort of avoid each other, uh, where we forbid configurations where there's an ambiguity. And uh, so we can you know, try to get some sense of what the phase diagram should look like by doing some mean field theory. So think about limits of the, of the couplings, and think about what happens. So when, when beta is, is large and positive, we want to minimize the area of the world sheets. That's the, that, that'll give the ordered phase. Um, when beta is large and negative, we want to maximize the areas of the world sheets so that if it's allowed, which it is in the case of the branch point regularization, that'll be an anti-ferromagnet. When, when phi, the log of the string coupling, is, is large and positive, we want to minimize the Euler character. Um, and when it's large and negative, we want to maximize the Euler character. So the configurations which which uh, the configuration which maximizes the Euler character um, in the case of the um, branch point regularization is is this uh, packed phase is what we call the packed phase where each of these regions is an independent spherical domain wall. So different colors are different different uh, connected regions of domain walls, um, and so this this maximizes the Euler character because it's a whole bunch of spheres. It's a sum. It's two times the number of the spheres. Um, the configuration which minimizes the Euler character, that, it, that is where it becomes large and negative, is the so-called plumber's nightmare phase, which is made of these sort of con uh, interconnected tubes, which you, know, you can see it has, it has negative curvature everywhere, and so it has a sort of extensive uh, negative Euler character. And in this analysis, we made an assumption that the unit cell was, was, wasn't any bigger than two by two by two in the preferred phase. Uh, we, we studied some slightly larger unit cells and didn't find dramatically better configuration. So I think this is some reasonable picture of what the phase diagram looks like um, at, at, lar at large values of these couplings. Um, and a similar analysis was done in the continuum it, with some soft matter motivation in the late, in the late 80s. Um, a nice thing about this, def this modification of the Eisen model is that the modification only depends on the configurations of the clusters, on the configuration of the domain walls. And so, um, uh, we can we can uh, use cluster updates. That is, um, you know, near near the critical point, correlation lengths and therefore correlation times grow, and and so uh, it's better if you can do Monte Carlo updates in a way which which flips many spins at the same time, and uh, um, so we can use this. Uh, actually, I guess we're using the Wolf algorithm um, to to propose. Um, to construct clusters of spins, which are which we propose to flip, that's a sub subset of a of a region of of contiguous up spins, and uh, and then we decide to flip them uh, with a probability that that depends on what change in the Euler character would result from that from doing that flip. So this is the only place where we modify the algorithm. Uh, that's the only place where it depends on on the string coupling. So that's a nice thing. So we can still do we can still do some simulations. And uh, okay, so here's some pictures of the results. This is for the branch point regularization at different values of the coupling around the ordinary Ising model at phi equals zero. Um, this is for the no touching regularization. In this case, the phi equals zero point is not the ordinary Ising model because we've forbidden certain configurations. Um, and really, the point of these plots, uh, where I'm plotting the the, the Binder, cu Binder cumulant, uh, it's a is it's a you know finite size scaling for the Binder cumulant as a way to measure the correlation length critical exponent. And, uh, and the point of those plots is that, um, as you might have expected, the, uh, the 3D Ising value of, of that correlation the critical, critical exponent gives the best data collapse for all values of the coupling uh, in, in the neighborhood of, of this, uh, the ordinary Ising model. And uh, probably some of you anticipated why this is true, which is that the perturbation we're making of the Ising model is a, is a Z2 even local operator. And so at the Ising fixed point, it can be decomposed into a sum of, uh, of, of even scaling operators. And uh, um, 
as you guys know better than most people, the Ising fixed point has only one symmetric relevant operator. Um, and so uh, this change that we're making, it'll, it'll shift the, the TC because it couples to the energy operator, but um, uh, its, other, its other effects are through irrelevant, irrelevant operators. And so the corrections to scaling should be different in a way that we, we, we probably could, but haven't measured. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't uh, take us out of the Ising universality class. Um, if, that is, if phi is small. If, if we make phi larger, then dramatic, more dramatic things do happen. So here's a, here's a sort of a cartoon real phase diagram. So in red are the mean field phase boundaries for the branch point resolution. And what I'm plotting here, this is a clever data visualization idea that Nabil had. In, in the amount of red is the intensity of the ferromagnetic order parameter. The amount of green is the intensity of the anti-ferromagnetic order parameter. And the amount of blue is an order parameter that we designed to detect the symmetry breaking pattern of the, of the packed phase. And, and it has some overlap with the plumber's nightmares phase as well. And so you see here, this is the, this is the ordered phase of the Ising model, the ferromagnetically ordered phase. Um, this is the plumber's nightmare phase. And over here, you see that there's this region of the packed phase. Um, and so the critical, critical temperature varies with the string coupling. And in particular, TC grows as G string, as we try to make G string weaker. And so a, a question we can ask is, how small can we, can we make this bare, bare string coupling? And uh, we can do that by setting, just setting beta to zero. Um, and in that case, the Ising transition occurs at some value of the string coupling, uh, which, is, which is like points which is like two thirds. Um, and so that's the, that's the value of the string coupling where the, the Ising temp critical temperature moves off to, to t equals infinity and you always stay in the ordered phase. Um, okay, so, so uh, um, a comment here about universality. Um, the Ising fixed point has, of course, being a fixed point, it has a fixed point value of this coupling that we're trying to, that we're, we're messing with, right? Which we, we can't change that, right? It just has some, some fixed point value, which we actually don't know. We haven't been able to figure it out. Um, the thing, you could think that the thing we're trying to do is make the dual string, string theory weakly coupled on the way to the fixed point. That is, starting from our lattice model, it, uh, uh, you know, there's some flow to the fixed point, which maybe some of which can also be described by, by a string theory, not quite as universal a string theory as one that would describe just the fixed point. Um, but that's, that's what we can hope to make, we, make weakly coupled by doing this. Um, Okay, so, so having done some, some, some work, we did some simulations, uh, we felt entitled to, to try to speculate about what the world sheet might, might be like, um, given, given what we know, and maybe, maybe I shouldn't belabor this too much, but uh, let's, let's see what happens. So a question that we, you know, we might wanna answer is, if we're really trying to find a string theory deal of the 3D Ising model and not 3D Ising gauge theory, then there's really a Z2 global symmetry, which should act on the string theory. And, uh, a hint for how that should act is, is in this construction of Polyakov, the string world sheet is a branch cut for the spin. Um, and a second hint is that in the Ising gauge theory, there actually are fermions in the spectrum. So the, um, there's in the spectrum of two, two, think about it in a quantum perspective, um, the particle spectrum involves an E particle, which is like an electric charge, an M particle, which is a lump of magnetic flux. And uh, these two particles are, are have, have some non-trivial mutual statistics, and in particular, their bound state uh, is, is a fermion. And so um, it's a fun exercise to try to match the spectrum to the spectrum of, a, of an RNS superstring. Um, in particular, the strings that we're talking about should be unoriented, because if you put two of them on top of each other, they, um, they go away. Um, and so we should study a, an unoriented RNS string and so, so the, the sectors that are allowed there are a remote remote sector and a never schwartz never schwartz sector, which are both, both describe bosons, and a single never schwartz remote sector, which describes a fermion. So, you know, one can try to identify these, these objects with the spectra of the 3D Ising gauge theory. Um, and this, this indeed has a space time fermion number symmetry, which, if we orbifold by it to make, to make a, uh, something more like the 3D Ising model, um, the fermionic sector goes away and we get two remote remote sectors. And uh, those remote remote sectors um, enjoy a, a chirality symmetry, that is, you know, remote, remote ground states are like um, 
a representation of quadrate algebra. And um, uh, in the same way, one can construct some analog of gamma five, which acts on the left, this Ramon sector, but not this one. And so we can tentatively try to identify the, this, this symmetry with the spin symmetry of the eyes of all. Um, so this was some attempt to analyze the symmetries. Um, it's tempting to try to interpret such a duality as a holographic duality, right? It, Could I ask a question? Yes, please, please, please. So just to make sure I understand, uh, to put to in contrast with, uh, let's say, Polycup's proposal, he said that it would be uh, uh, the super string uh, in three target space dimensions, right? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, and, I'm, I'm trying to, um, how to say, so when I say it's, I'm going to interpret it as a holographic duality, that means I'm going to add some extra dimensions compared to that, yeah. Okay, uh, and, and let's say, if Dissler said that it would, would be a bosonic unoriented uh, string theory. Yeah, right? he was. Yeah, he was also thinking about three dimensions. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, this and, was. And, you, and here you're saying that it would be. Boy, well, I guess you're about to say that it's more than three. Uh, yeah. With, right. With with some hindsight, it seems it seems like there's there's no reason to think that it has to be in just three dimensions, right? That's maybe that's yeah, but, the that's the major progress since 1992. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, but. Uh, to contrast to Dissler's proposal, you, uh, you're still saying that it, it should be the super string, uh, well, unoriented super string. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it, it's, it seems like there is some some evidence that there's some, yeah, there's some fermionic structure in there. Um, I don't want to push on it too hard, but yeah, I think so. Uh, I mean, if it's a super string theory in a space time with more dimensions uh, and it's stuck somewhere. Uh, there should be uh, uh, massive resonances of excitations on the string uh, that, 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 that can be detected in principle to probe these extra dimensions. Yeah, that's right. That's right, actually. And, and there's evidence for them in, in numerics. Yeah, that's right. right. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll make a comment about that later. That's exactly right. Um, yeah, good, good point. Um, okay, so... so I, I you know what, what I'm about to say. I, I don't think I don't think you should take too seriously. I'm just going to make some naive comments uh, about the form it should take. Um, uh, you know, naively at the fixed point, the bulk space time should be something like ADS four. Um, a basic problem with that is that a nonlinear sigma model with target space ADS four is not a not a CFT. It, it wants to wants to grow uh, towards the infrared. That's true at least at large radius. There's some evidence for a, a small radius fixed point uh, from Fries and Gubser. Um, or maybe some of the remote, remote Rhone fluxes that I just mentioned uh, could stabilize the space time as in more familiar ADS examples. Um, but a second problem with that is that adding a single extra dimension doesn't, doesn't solve the problem of making it a critical string theory. And uh, it might be nice to, um, to figure out how to, how to saturate the uh, conformal anomaly. And it's tempting to add a space-like linear dilaton in that radial direction to, can to cancel the vial anomaly. Um, but the, a linear dilaton in that direction isn't so compatible with the target space conformal, conformal symmetry that, that motivated uh, thinking about ADS4 in the first place. In particular, uh, under a space-time scale transformation, we have to shift phi right, to cancel the, the scaling of these spatial coordinates. Um, and the linear dilaton term on the world sheet action shifts, would shift under that, under that transformation if, if the dilaton is linear in this phi. This is supposed to be a curly phi. Um, and so I'm not sure what the resolution of this is. One, there's some, there's a paper by Umut Gursoy um, where he was studying critical points of holographic uh, theories in the in XY and, and Ising universality class, um, where he he showed that it's possible to preserve some conformal invariance in such a kind of non-critical string construction, uh, which I haven't I still haven't absorbed entirely. Uh, a perhaps more conservative possibility is to have a what you might call a composite linear dilaton. That is, add to the world sheet a term which which plays the role of this vial anomaly compensating field, but where the, this pink phi is instead a composite operator, like the log of some scaling operator, log of some operator of definite scaling dimension. Um, for example, the ADS4 kinetic term made of these fields, and so that's invariant under target space scale scale transformations by construction, um, but nevertheless can can compensate for the vial anomaly. Um, this leaves open the, the very important question of what does it mean to take the log of the derivative of a field? And the context where, where we know how to answer that is a, a less ambitious uh, application of the string theory 
namely, we think about um, the string theory as expanded around some, some configuration um, of a, a large flat domain wall. That is, we make a big string and ask about its fluctuations. And so, so this, is, uh, this solves the problem of the derivative being well-defined because, because x is extended along some direction. It's proportional to sigma, so the derivative is not 0. Um, in this context, the world sheet coordinate fields, at least the transverse one, arises as a goldstone for breaking of translations by, by the wall that we put there. And uh, there's a, um, and so people have studied this in both the 3D Ising model and in 3D Ising gauge theory, um, and uh, looked at what the string theory prediction was for, in particular, the finite size scaling of Wilson loops. Um, so in the, in the 3D Ising gauge theory case, the um, the Wilson loop is, is the analog of putting a large flat domain wall. We make a large, large Wilson loop. And so the, you know, there, there's this prediction using basically free effective string theory in terms of the Dedekind eta function coming from the, mode, the modes of the uh, transverse uh, position of the string. And uh, this is, and this I should emphasize, this calculation is done in the ordered phase, pretty deep in the ordered phase. And their simulations actually match, match this, 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 this function, uh, match this function very well. Um, moreover, so what I was referring to in, in answer to Q's question, um, uh, around the same time, no, no, a little bit later, um, Julius Kudi and collaborators studied um, a, a large domain wall, and they studied the spectrum, just directly studied the spectrum of the domain wall, in, again, in the ordered phase. And they find a, a breathing mode, which it's depicted here, which, which describes uh, fluctuations of the, the thickness of the wall. And, what, and in the ordered phase, that mode is gapped, but I think one can very reasonably expect that as you move closer to the critical point, this mode will become gapless and can be regarded as the goal of mode for the breaking of scale transformations at the critical point by the, by the shape, by the profile of the wall, which should be interpretable as the bulk, bulk rate of coordinate. So I think there, there actually is some evidence uh, for this this extra dimension, at least in this limited context of studying fluctuations of a of a of a large large string. Um, okay, so so there are some 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 puzzles about this this duality, which uh, we certainly haven't answered, and and most of them revolve around the fact that that there's no large n uh, in the three D Ising model, and one way to state it is that that string theory in flat space has a has a Hagedorn exponential growth of single string states at high energy. And in usual examples of ADS-CFT, this growth of the density of states is matched by the growth of the number of words made out of traces of products of, of uh, matrix, mat n by n matrices. Um, and that only keeps growing at asymptotically large energies if, if n is asymptotically large. Um, the fact that our weak coupling limit doesn't, you know, doesn't involve any kind of large n is a, seems like a problem for this. And basically the only possible excuse is that maybe large curvature of the target space removes the Hagedorn spectrum. Um, okay, and then another funny thing about, about the string theory that we're talking about here is that in the 3D Ising model, the domain walls can't end, right? The domain walls are boundaries of regions, and so they can't, they, it's not possible in just in that sum for them to have boundaries. So it's, that makes it seem like this is a string theory with no, no open string, no dynamical debrains, right? In the sense that no open strings form on their own. You can put them in by, make, by, by studying Sandy Wilson, but, but uh, it's sort of a, an exotic object in that sense. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say about the, the world sheet theory. And now let me return to what I think is maybe the most interesting outcome of what we did, which is um, a mystery about the ordinary 3D Ising model. So we measured the, the average Euler character per cluster. That is, we, we, we computed the total Euler character of all of the walls. We computed the number of clusters of walls by, by this hoshin kopelman algorithm, and, uh, and then took the ratio. Right, so this is a quantity which it approaches two in, deep in the ordered phase, because any domain wall in that case is just a little bubble, which is spherical. And it approaches minus infinity when, uh, when the temperature goes to infinity, because uh, there's, there's just a big mess of, of complicated higher genus surfaces. Um, and in between, it, uh, it passes through zero. And an interesting phenomenon is that, so here, this, this, this is for various values of the coupling of the, of the dilaton, uh, and this is for the two possible resolutions. And an interesting thing is that um, in each case, the, this purple line is the, is the critical point as measured by the data collapse of the Binder cumulant, and uh, this red line is zero, 
It's just where the Euler character is equal to zero. And it seems like the, um, this, this crossing of the Euler character occurs not only at the Ising critical point, but also at zero. And more, more over the flexion. May I have a question? Yes, please. Uh, is this your uh, simulation based on your modified model or originalizing model with uh, correct uh, sign factor and so on? Um, good. So, so, so this is a um, um, this measure of average of kappa g, g or the characteristic. Right. So, so each of these plots is is um, different values of of this this. Uh, String coupling parameter. This is with this is with this um, branch point resolution. This is with the self-avoiding resolution. This model okay, here, okay. but th this model here is the ordinary ISI model. This one here, it's it's. Uh, um, you could argue with the the way we're measuring the Euler character. So that depends on our rules for resolving the collisions. So, but but the, but the dynamics of the model. Did you Sorry? try to calculate average uh, Euler characteristic? From very beginning, all, uh, the uh, definition of uh, Ising model just. Uh, yeah, this is the right. This is the closest we can come to that. Yeah, that's that right. one is that. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, yeah. So and and moreover, the fluctuations of this quantity, what you might call the topological susceptibility, uh, is very small in the ordered phase, and and grows in in the disordered phase. But at the transition, it's pretty small. So it looks like you know one could say that. The 3D Ising CFT is 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 dominated by by donuts. It's that most of the domain walls are are tori. Um, after we submitted our paper, we learned we got an interesting email from David Hughes, um, pointing out that a similar observation was made in 1992 in a model with self-avoiding walls, much like our no-touching model, and uh, and he looked at it more closely, and so here's the this is t temperature. This is the um, something like the Bender cube. No, it's Yes, okay. So something that should cross at the critical point. So here's the critical point. And, um, and here's his plot of the Euler character divided by the volume. And you see, so at the critical point, which is like 0.35 something, uh, it's a little bit away from the critical point. Um, so we thought, you know, so, so I think um, it would have been a contradiction if this had crossed because uh, there isn't a local scaling variable in the 3D Ising model. Uh, with such a with a small dimension, uh, so I think that would have been a contradiction. And so we we got excited because the thing we were measuring is not actually a local observable, right? Because we're dividing by this number of clusters, which is not something that you can measure locally. And moreover, the number of clusters grows with system size. Um, and so we, we were optimistic that our observable observable might be, you know, more interesting than what what David Hughes had studied. And so now we so then we tried to zoom in in the last couple of weeks on the critical point. So here's the plot I showed of just the vanilla ordinary ISI model. And here's a, getting a little bit closer to the critical point. I'll explain what this second line is in just a minute. It still looks pretty good. Here's even closer here. Maybe it's looking a little funny. And then here's the best simulation we've done so far. Um, it looks like the, the, this, this crossing of zero is, is not at the critical point. So that makes, you know, this, be, this is like, uh, you know, this is our small version of, of uh, what happened in 1999, right? Previously, we've been trying to explain why the cosmological constant is zero. Now we have to explain why it's small. Um, so it seems like there's a small number in the Ising model, which is which is you know either the proximity of this this transition uh, to the, the proximity of where chi crosses zero to the critical point, uh, and or moreover, uh, a way to think of it is why is the dependence on the system size of the number of the, of Euler character per cluster so weak? One thing that we thought it might be is that there's a, another transition ne pretty near to the 3D Ising transition, which is where the domains of upspins percolate. This is a, a, a non-thermodynamic transition. It happens, you know, so this is the, the Ising TC. This is, this is this crossing of the number of percolating clusters. It, it happens, you know, some finite distance away and is not accompanied by any signature in the thermodynamics. It's, it's like the roughening transition in, in ISMBH theory. Um, and so we thought maybe the thing we were saying had to do with that, but it's much closer to the Ising transition than to the percolation. And so a, a question that I'd really like to know the answer to is, is this smallness of chi near the critical point a universal phenomenon? Um, 
you might think it's not because, well, it's not clear whether there's actually any kind of singular behavior associated with this observable. Um, on the other hand, it seems to happen for you know, these two very microscopically very different uh, realizations of the Ising universality class. Um, okay, so my final comment is that you know, I've, I've tried to you know, say a few things about uh, interpreting the domain walls in the Ising model in terms of string world sheets. I think probably it's a good idea not to be too dogmatic about the idea that the right, uh, that the right strings to think about are, are literally the domain walls between the upspins and the downspins. There's some interesting work suggesting that the effective string uh, is actually should actually be regarded as a sort of coarse grain object with you know made of made of many many handles, um, and and moreover, uh, another reasonable choice that we might make is for the strings is the boundaries of the clusters involved in the in the Monte Carlo cluster algorithm. So um, a reason that I say that is that these walls are designed to have their percolation tr transition right at the Ising. Uh, Ising critical temperature, in contrast to the to the walls that I've been talking about, which have the percolation transition elsewhere, and so I think it might, it'll be interesting to study the statistical statistical topology of these walls as well, and maybe I don't know, maybe those guys do have the have the zero crossing right at the right at the Ising critical point. Um, okay, so if anybody has any any uh, ideas or suggestions about about this phenomenon, I'd, I'd really I'd really love to hear it. Um, where where uh, uh, yeah, so that, that's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, John. Um, so we had uh, about 150 participants. So that was, I think, a resounding success. Uh, are any any further questions? Yeah, I have, I have two, uh, I think they're related questions. Hi, Tom. Hi, hi, John. Um, so you, you said to us that you didn't know what the string coupling was near the critical point, but yes. there's no reason to think that it's particularly small, right? I agree. So, yes. I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm a little skeptical of using continuum string theory if the string coupling is not small at the critical point. And then related to that, all the continuum string theories I know have the property that the genus expansion is not Borel summable. Mm -hmm. Whereas in your model, I think pretty clearly it is away from the transition. Oh, um, how do you see that? Well, I, I think the thing that you've defined for finite volume mm -hmm. um, is, is just a finite sum. Sure. And so that, that summation, you know, the expansion in that parameter is going to be analytic with some radius of convergence. But in the thermodynamic limit, that might go to zero, right? I, mean, um, I would think it does. Yeah, that's possible. I would, be, I would be a little bit surprised if it were not Borel summable in, in the lattice model. Uh huh. Um, because, I, it's, because it's countable, I guess. Yeah, yeah, and because, you know, it, it appears in the usual way, so it's sort of a, a Laplace transform of something with respect to that parameter and so on. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I see, I see what you're saying. So that you're saying that, that suggests that um, one shouldn't look for a description of, of, the Ising, of the string sum even infinitesimally away from the critical point. Well, it, it worries me. Let, uh -huh. let, uh -huh. let me not say you shouldn't, but I'm yeah. worried about it. Uh, okay, I see what you mean. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah, fair enough. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any further questions? I, I have a question about the zoom in for the uh, smallest ah. possible range of beta. Good. So, um, if you did expect this to be a scaling variable, right, or scaling collapse, uh -huh. And I see two failures in this picture, right? One is that the curves do not intersect at a single point, and the second is they don't intersect at the critical point that we expect. Right, that's right, and I agree. both signatures are very clear indications, in the usual case, of finite size corrections, which are pretty strong, and usually come from irrelevant variables. So that's a very known feature for analysis of scaling collapses in two-parameter scaling data. And in, in other phase transitions. So, so if we knew, if we thought that it should be a scaling variable, 
that there should be a crossing there. Right. And we saw this, then we would conclude that it was finite size exactly. effects of, of real and operates. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Um, however, um, in, in this, in this situation, uh, I didn't show it, but the, the data collapse of, of things that we know should collapse is beautiful. So like the, the, the bender, the bender kinlet crosses beautifully at the right point. Um, and, uh, and secondly, we're not sure if this is a scaling variable. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, I would, I would, I would like to interpret in the, it, interpret it in the way that you're describing, but, um, I'm not sure if we should. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah, I agree. Um, anything else? Okay, if not, we can thank John again. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And we'll announce the next seminar uh, soon enough. <laughs>